Okay, so welcome everyone. Week 10, we're looking at leases. And this is one of those topics which has been kicking around as an interesting accounting issue for quite some time. Uh, to give you some background, in May of this year, the IASB came out with, I think it's their second exposure draft on trying to deal with the problem that lease accounting has. Um, now, they've been trying to deal with this issue for eight years now. Like it has been a longstanding concern. Um, and what we're gonna do today is to actually look at what that concern is. Um, and to be able to understand what that concern is, we have to on one hand sort of marry up what we know about management incentives and company incentives, and on, and on the other hand, marry up what we know or what we're about to find out about how lease accounting works and how that looks in terms of the financials. Um, because we have seen over the past number of years quite an increase in the number of companies using a certain sort of lease um, to finance what they're doing. And there's very good reasons as to why, very rational reasons from their point of view as to why they've done that. So we're gonna explore what that is. Uh, that doesn't seem to be working. So first of all, we're gonna have a look at what a lease is. Uh, we're gonna look at to why, that's why it's not working, it's not plugged in. We're gonna look at what a lease is, why the accounting is problematic, um, what company incentives are for lease structuring. So that's kind of your preamble into it. And look, I mean, there are very good incentives for companies to do the things that they're doing. Um, and in terms of the dollar figures that we're looking at, they are substantial. So this isn't a small kind of minor issue that, that's been dealt with here. This is a sizable economic concern that is, that is out there. We're then going to try, we're going to step through what a finance lease is and the accounting for it, what an operating lease is and accounting for it, and also what sale and leaseback transactions are and how to deal with some of the, the issues that arise out of those. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you, well, if anyone's living out of home, generally you're going to be, not obviously all the case, but generally going to be renting. I know I am. When I was in London, I was renting. Um, if, you go to that, if you go down to the DVD store, um, you're going to be renting and all it is is an agreement where you don't get to you don't own that particular asset you just get to use it for a specific period of time um, and so it's a there is a contract there and you will pay for it and you'll get to use an asset now just to give you an idea of different sort of leases and, and this these aren't in the slides but nothing really you need to write down well, obviously it's all going to be pictures but as you're aware I was over in London not that long ago um, so to get there this is me at the airport. You're probably wondering what the hell that thing is. When you're traveling with your three-year-old on a 24-hour flight, you need to do what you can to kind of keep them from losing their minds. That was her favorite toy at that point in time. So I managed to walk around Sydney Airport looking like a, a bit of a wally. Um, but you do what you have to do. We caught a plane. Um, now, obviously, it's not the only way to get to the UK, but it is obviously a, you know, one of the, the major ways to do it. Airlines are one of the big users of the sort of financing that we're going to be looking at. And we're going to look at Qantas's financials to an extent um, in a few slides times. But a lot of airlines, a lot of airplanes that airlines use are actually leased. Um, they don't technically own them. Um, that said, for all intents and purposes, they look like they own them. They've got to maintain them. They've got to look after them. They pay for insurance on them. Um, they get what would be all the benefits of using them as an asset <clears throat> excuse me, as an asset which they own. So that's one sort of lease. It was over there, we didn't buy a TV because you've got to buy a TV license over in the UK and we really couldn't be bothered doing that. Um, that and we were trying to get away from watching too much. But we you know, still do like watching stuff and it's really good the fourth, I'm still trying to catch up on it, but the fourth season's obviously out, but went down to the local DVD store and rented DVDs. Now that's another sort of lease. It's a rental, ar rental ar arrangement. I don't own that particular uh, that particular disc, but I get to use it for a, for a predetermined period of time. We then went traveling around Europe and we went off and hired a car for two months. Um, and in that, we, I don't know, like, it was weird. We didn't have to pay, like basically the way the insurance, and we, this car had quite good insurance on it, and it was brand new when we got it. Um, I don't know how this company, make, they make money off this without having government assistance. I could basically, I could have a crash, cause a crash, 
completely destroy it, someone else could crash into me, completely destroy it, it could be stolen, pretty much anything, and I wouldn't be paying a cent for it. So I don't know quite how that worked in terms of the insurance premiums, but it was embedded in the price that we paid. Um, that's another sort of lease arrangement. So what we're trying to get at with all that is there are lots of different types of leases that you can have and lots of different types of rental arrangements that you can have. And if we were to account for them in all the same way, economically they do look different in, certain, in different situations, so we need to pick that difference, those differences up in terms of how the accounting works. So for most car type leases, if you're going down and hiring a car for a short period of time, generally you're not going to be leasing that car for a substantial period of that car's life. You're going to be leasing it for a week, maybe even a day, in our case, we lease it for two months. That car would probably last you know, a good five, 10 years, possibly more. So we're only taking it for a very small period of its life, whereas with a lot of airplane leases, they're looking at quite long-term timeframes. They could be a 20-year lease, it could be a 30-year lease. It's economically much different. Again, I mean, I don't even know what that car is, but let's say it's about 10 grand. If you're paying $17 a day, you probably, it's still not gonna be a large chunk of the value of that car that you're paying on a daily basis. Um, whereas the way that a lot of these major leases get set up is, is actually quite a significant portion of the overall value of the asset. Um, generally, you're gonna return the asset. In these cases, you probably keep the asset. Um, not always, but that may well happen. Um, it may also be the case that you've got very specific equipment and look an airplane is a bad example of that because there are other, going to be other companies that can use that airplane, there may be other air, airlines, there may be just company would like to keep it. Um, but if you've got an asset which is very much tailored to you and you have leased it, it's probably going to be pretty hard for the person leasing the asset to be able to lease it to someone else. So that changes the dynamic a little bit. So where it becomes problematic, and we've touched on this idea, and I know Rob would have touched on this idea before, is that what we see as this legal idea of what an asset is and who controls it and who owns it and, and who has title to it is different from what the economic substance is. So from an airline lease, if we're talking about a major long-term airline lease, legally, the airline won't actually own that asset. So from a legal perspective, they would not show an asset on their books. But the accounting doesn't use a legal definition, so we do take this much more economic approach to doing things. So if we control that asset, if it looks for all intents and purposes like we own it, then we need to bring it onto the books. Um, so legal definitions suggest we don't bring it onto the books. Economic definitions suggest that we do. Which should we adopt and does it matter? Well, it does. And to add to this problem is if we go out and as we go through some of the numbers and we'll, we'll be drawing some stuff up in a little while and actually we'll have to use Excel for some of it because otherwise we'll be here for, for hours and hours and hours. Um, if we were to go out and borrow money and buy an asset, that's two separate transactions. We've gone to the bank, we borrowed some money, we've got cash in, we've gone off somewhere else, we've put money down, we pay for an asset, and now we have debt because we owe the bank, and we have an asset sitting there because we've gone off and bought something. But if we have a situation where we have leased an asset, implicit within that is sort of an interest rate, implicit in that is an interest expense. So the accounting for that sort of lease should actually mirror what the, the accounting for borrowing and buying an asset should be. And if it differs, we have a problem because then we have an incentive for companies to use a particular type of structuring to finance what they're doing. 